Hi, my name is Dirk Norris. I'm the executive director of the New Mexico Film Foundation, and I'm here on behalf of George R. R. Martin's Jean Cocteau Cinema, and talking with co-directors Lydia Pilcher and Ginny Moeller, um, co-directors of the film Radium Girls, uh, and welcome. Hello. Hi. How Hi. <laughs> It, this is a really interesting movie. It's done um, very well and in kind of a unique way. And um, I, I just think it's really terrific. So uh, give us an idea of what the film is about and um, then we'll get into kind of how it, it came about being made. Okay, Jenny, you wanna start? Oh, sure. Well. The film is about, it tells the story, the true story of teenage factory workers in the 1920s in New Jersey who painted glow in the dark watch dials with radioactive paint and were instructed to lick the paintbrushes. And this is the coming of age story that happens when the women start to get sick and realize that the company knew about it. Um, I, I, I... I realized um, not long ago that I had um, one of those radium dial watches as a kid. And I don't think I had it for very long. And I don't think I suffered any, um, you know, bad side effects other than the arm growing out of my back. But um, aside from that, um, so uh, Lydia, how did this, uh, how did this project come about? Well, I, was looking for an environmentally themed project. I wanted to blend my environmental activism and passion with my storytelling career. And I had been looking for um, the right project. I wanted it to be a narrative, dramatic project. And a friend of mine knew Jenny and knew that Jenny and Brittany Shaw had been writing a story about the, the Radium Girls. And um, I asked to read the screenplay read it right away, immediately fell in love with the story of these two girls, that it was told through these two teenagers' eyes and they had big dreams while they were painting these glow-in-the-dark watch dials in Orange, New Jersey. One wanted to become a movie star, one wanted to go to Egypt and conduct archeological digs. And it felt very cinematic and a perfect sort of arc for a coming of age story where something very much bigger than them happened um, as this rude awakening. But um, Ginny has, it's a very interesting how she found the story. So now I'm going to <laughs> let you yeah. tell that part. So in, in 2012, it was very, it was a moment of synchronicity that I'm, I'm so grateful that I paid attention to. I was working as an archival researcher in 2012 um, uh, on a documentary about the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos. And I stumbled across this very cryptic reference to the Radium Girls. It said, we all remembered the tragic dial painters of World War I, because they were talking about needing protections for the Manhattan Project workers against the radioactivity. And I looked it up and I just, I, stum I found the, the Wikipedia page called Radium Girls. And I read the story, I could not believe that I'd never known the story before. I, I turned to my friend and colleague at the time, Brittany Shaw, and we couldn't believe it wasn't a movie. And so we began writing the screenplay. And um, some of the characters uh, are amalgamations of, of several people, right? So, uh, so how do you, in, in writing the script, how do you decide what elements to include and um, how, how many um, different aspects or different people's characters do you bring together to make this one, one character? Well, for us, that was really a case by case basis. There are some characters, the factory owner, Arthur Roeder, he's more or less intact. The girls were where we found composites to be what, what we were drawn to for the storytelling, because you know the, the anchor for us were these three sisters who had worked at the Orange, New Jersey plant. And one of them had died very early and she had been diagnosed with syphilis. And then two of the other sisters went on to be part of this court case. And so Brittany and I, especially thinking about 
this teenage world and what it would mean to go through this with your sister when you have other hopes and dreams and plans really honed in on this idea of the three sisters. And from there, we drew on other research that added elements of understanding of, of what life was like for a dial painter. And there's, there's different elements um, pulling these um, gals in different directions, right? Um, different aspirations, but also um, uh, political pressures that are being put on them. Well, I think you, you find a lot of the pressures that I think people are feeling today um, with COVID where you know that, you know, it's not necessarily safe to go back to work, but people need their jobs and it hasn't really been figured out yet in terms of what all the solutions are and economies are tanking. Um, there's not enough information from science or not enough available information from science. You don't know if you can trust the research. Um, so I think that all of those forces that I think pull all of us apart today in trying to make sense of this pandemic that we're in also pulled apart the people involved in the story of the radium girls. But there were people involved in that story and other sort of true life characters um, are like Catherine Wiley, who was director of the National Consumers League in New Jersey, and uh, Alice Hamilton, who was a, a Harvard professor in toxology, who happened to know Dr. Drinker, who was also a professor at, at uh, Harvard in the Department of Public Health. Um, all of these women who had sort of been very active in the suffragist movement had really worked hard for the right to vote and were ready to use it, were paying attention to what was happening in this world of industrialization. And I think that that is part of what really elevated the Radium Girls story to, um, to become you know, what is really referred to as a notorious case. Um, and it, it you know, garnered the national media engine attention. And that's really why I think we're even talking about it right now, even though it's been buried in history for a while. How was this situation kind of brought um, uh, to the conscience of the professionals? Um, I mean, what was there like a first case or was somebody saying, hey, there's something irregular going on here and we need to look further into it or how'd that go? It, it was actually a woman who worked in the New Jersey Health Department and cases had been reported of these mysterious illnesses in the dial painting factory and no one was paying attention to it. So she, understanding this, this network that existed, took her concerns to Catherine Wiley at the New Jersey Consumers League and she said, basically, the state's not doing anything. There's a lot of industry connections, corporate connections happening with the state government at the time. Can you look into this? Because we know that's what you do. Um, it, it's, it seems to me, um, well, you mentioned, Lydia, this is, a, this is a story that how come nobody knows about it? And um, there are, I think, uh, a lot of stories like this out there that people don't know about. Um, are, are you uh, both or um, either of you tackling another story um, now that, <laughs> that people might not be so aware of? Um, I, well, I think we, Jenny and I are busy. We've got, we've got lots going on. Um, I thought you were going somewhere else with your question, so I'm going to go oh. to the somewhere else first. Oh. <laughs> Only because, Feel because free to follow. <laughs> I, I think it's, I think it's interesting, you know, Ginny and Brittany were archival researchers working, you know, on documentaries for the History Channel and other networks. And one of the things that I'm kind of, I look back now and I kind of muse about is the fact that there were, there were some stories that were part of our world building landscape that I think people have heard of, like Sacco and Benzetti. And, um, but I realized that Tulsa was something that, you know, we added into the into the landscape of the story um, as a backdrop. And I realized that this year in 2020 was the first time that a lot of Americans really understood what happened in Tulsa because it became a big conversation due to, you know, TV series like The Watchmen and Lovecraft. And we 
you know, everybody celebrated Juneteenth this year, but it hadn't really been celebrated outside of the African American community before this year. And I, it's it's interesting that there are so many things that are not well known to us in terms of in terms of our storytelling. But I do I do think now to just kind of bounce back to your original question, I do think that you know we do have more consciousness now about the value of of stories that have not been told. And uh, I think a lot, there's a lot of female storytelling, which just has never seen the light of day in our history, and as well as other, you know, undervalued and underrepresented voices in our culture. So I think that that's, I think that is starting to change. And it's exciting that now that, now that there's a recognition that, you know, audiences are valued in a, in a more diverse way, and that storytellers can be valued in a, in a more diverse way. So it's, a, it's an exciting time to be thinking about the kinds of stories that you want to tell. And history, history always offers a, an interesting portal into um, any kind of examination of, of human nature in our lives. Right, right. Well, Jenny, do you think there are now tons of people combing through archives and, and uh, have become researchers? And <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I think this idea, I think this idea of like discovering history is so interesting because that was the experience I had. It was as if I had just discovered the story for myself, but it had always been there. And I think one of the most impactful things that, I mean, the Radium Girls had made, a, had a lot of impact. One of the most impactful things that they did that I think is such an exciting and, and powerful example is they, they got their side of the story down on paper. Mm -hmm. They asked the radium company to testify, to go on the record. So though, even though there were, you know, manipulation and machinations at the time, you can go to the Library of Congress and you can read the trial transcripts and you can read the radium company lying. And you know that they're lying because today we, there's no question that radioactivity can be very dangerous, especially if you're eating it. And they created that, that paper trail. And I think that that is, those are the things in the archives where sometimes the stories in the archives are manipulations too. There are versions of the Radium Girls story that were written down by the scientists paid off by the corporation that tell a different story. So I think as, I think something I love that historians do and that researchers do is, is not just find the artifacts, but then question them and say, what's the other side of this? Well, history is written by those that are in power, I guess. Well, um, there's always choices to be made. So some, somebody's choosing which stories get to be told. Right, and, and traditionally the choices have been, um, have been uh, decided by old white guys. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that kind of changing now. And, you know, like I said, there's a lot of stories out there that um, I think folks will be excited to, to hear about and, and uh, to, to see. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the actual um, process of, of making this film. Um, and, and start with casting. Was that a, was that a difficult process or um, did it go pretty painlessly? Yeah, I think it, it, um, we had a wonderful casting director in New York, um, and we have the benefit of a amazing Broadway, you know, stage tradition in New York, which um, a lot of our actors are very um, prominent, you know, theater folks. And we, you know, really spent the most amount of time making sure we were casting the Cavallo sisters in a way that um, was would feel compelling. And Abby Quinn was somebody I had worked with before on a, on a smaller film, um, The Sisterhood of Night. She was still in high school in Boston. And um, I knew that, you know, she would be terrific because she has this very, um, she has a sense of presence that I call the X factor. When, when somebody has something that you sort of pick it up on screen and you feel that sort of deep soul and that connection, there's a magnetism to it. And uh, Abby definitely has that. And the character of Bessie 
was very much inspired by um, the diaries of Catherine Schaub, who was one of the radium girls in the Orange, New Jersey factory. And Ginny and um, Brittany had read her diaries and it was very clear that she had this kind of sparkling, you know, sensibility with um, this kind of irrepressible energy. She was a dreamer and that really inspired, I think the way they, you know, constructed B Bessie's character and, and Joey King just seemed to be the perfect, um, the perfect actress to play that part. She was 17 at the time when we filmed um, her in the role of Bessie. I, I think they did a, um, they all did a really wonderful job. Um, I, I, I think, you know, casting, um, trying to find the people that um, you maybe already have in your mind is difficult. Do you, do you approach it with trying to being open-minded or, or are you um, very specific in, in kind of looking for a, a, a type and in, in the kind of actor you want to get? I mean, there, there must be those, you know, surprises, the, the X factor that says, oh, this is the one we never thought, but yeah, yeah, she's the one. Well, I think that's, you know, in working with a casting director, you have someone who is really, their profession is really to have this um, big overview. And, you know, you, you want to try to include, you know, characters um, or actors who have some kind of recognition so that, you aren't, you know, completely at a loss when you go to market the movie. So there, there's a little bit of that factor going on. I mean, having said that, we're, we were a small, you know, budgeted film. We were under a million dollars. And so most of the people who came and were in the film were really drawn to the story and drawn to the, um, what we were doing creatively, which was fantastic. And um, I think that you, you know, Ginny, you must have had, you know, you must be writing with people in mind when you're, when you're writing, right? You do a little bit of that kind of casting because it also helps when you're pitching it to talk about different actors. It helps people understand sort of where you're going, what you're thinking. Um, yeah, I, I think it's such a, a leap that happens when it goes from the page into taking real form. In, you know, from the from the casting, but also the production design and and um, and the costumes and things that have this tangible shape that were once in your mind. I have this really vivid memory of walking into the Cavallo house for the first time, and it was it was it had just come to life <laughs> from the page. And so I think I think the casting experience was similar where it's, you know, you have wisps and ideas and this sort of sense of the energy and the tone of a character. And then you see them walk out with their costume on and suddenly they're, they're, they're a real, real character. Mm. Uh, Jenny, was there, um, was there any rewriting done after you started your principal photography? Oh, I thought you were just going to say when after the first few drafts of the script, there's a lot of rewriting done <laughs> up, up from then until we, until we shot the film. There were, I think in Lydia's um, production company in her office, we just had note cards all over the wall for a long time, right. moving the things around. But after principal photography, I think, I think it was sort of, nothing major. I think, you know, as we got into the edit and realized that there were connective pieces that we wanted to bring in to help the story feel cohesive. I think there were, you know, moments, moments within, you know, as we were shooting the scenes together, discovering parts of the scenes that felt like they needed to get amped up more. But I, there wasn't ever a moment of, you know, an all nighter re rewriting <laughs> <laughs> pivotal scene, although that sounds dramatic. When when you were writing this, did you know you wanted to um, direct as well? I did. I did. I, I had been really excited about thinking thinking about that and thinking about it as a, a collaboration too. You know, I was oh, okay. So yeah, thinking, thinking in terms of like co-directing even before you met Lydia. Yeah, I think I think this idea of partnership within this sort of I mean directing a film making a film is, is this massive 
creative undertaking and, and collaboration is so much a part of that. And so I, I was just excited to take it from the page and in, into the real world. And I also, you know, was a, I, I wasn't that long out of film school. I had never, I didn't have a really a, a, a narrative piece of work. And so I think collaboration made a lot of sense. And um, so Lydia, how was that, how was that process um, uh, being co-director? Well, I think, you know, because Jenny and I had, had worked and also with our producer, Emily McAvoy, we had, we had worked with um, each other as a team and, and Brittany, the other writer. So, you know, we had done a lot of the kind of creative development together. And I think we felt very much um, of an ilk and a shared aesthetic. And when, you know, as we got closer to filming. I mean, I think we had ambitions that we would raise more money. And we um, got to a certain point where I was saying, maybe we should just wait another six months and try to raise more money. And, and everybody else was like, no, we really, we really want to do it. And we had found this amazing DP who had said, um, I can do it with one grip and one electric. And we, I was just like, oh my God, nobody is ever going to say that to me again in my life. Um, and I think it, we just knew because we were a small budget that, you know, we, I mean, we shot the initial, um, the initial round of principal photography in 18 days. Then we, we did a couple of days to um, embellish when we were in post-production and we had a cut. But I think we knew that it was just going to be all hands on deck all the way to make it happen. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we had two cameras. So sometimes, you know, Jenny and I each had a camera or sometimes I took a camera away and we were just, we, you know, we just, we just had sort of a very um, collective collaborative way to get an enormous amount of work done every day. And um, it was, you know, what's fantastic is because Jenny had written the script and she, knew everything inside and out that often the day would start with Jenny talking to the actors about their, their characters and the scenes. And, and I would start working with the DP and the shot construction and we would just, but it would just really, it just really flowed. And it, and um, it was a, you know, it was a great way to work given that, you know, the nature of the production had sort of a very sort of art gorilla spirit to it. <laughs> As Indies tend to do. Yes. <laughs> um, Ginny, any particularly difficult um, days of shooting or were they all hard? I just, I just have this memory of, I can't even remember what was happening, but it was, it was hard. I just remember it was a, I, you know, I think maybe it was one of the big factory days. There was a lot happening and it was, and it was hard. And I just, I have this memory of being, of, of being like, this is, the hardest thing I've ever done. And I'm also having the best time that I've ever had. And this is the best job possible. And having those two things go together felt really meaningful because I, I you know, set is always hard. And, and I think, but also being able to say, I, I love this and it's hard. I, so that the, the shoot was an experience of that for me. Hard in a physical sense or, or hard in just getting um, the, that shot that you really want to get or? I think that's a great question. I think I would almost say in a, in like a big picture sense, because, you know, we, <laughs> there's, there's a finite amount of time. We've been developing this script together and this film together for what felt like an infinite amount of time, <laughs> you know, like years together. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you know, you're in the factory, you're, you're here, the factory is built, it exists. The extras are here, the actors are here, and you have a ticking clock. And, and you've been imagining it for a long time. And so how do you, how do you, you know, wrestle with the reality of, of time and space and money in, in the way when you're, you're bringing to it, we were bringing to it these really big and beautiful ideas that had been growing for a long time. Um, real time filmmaking is different than film school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you both went to the same film school, but at different times. Yes. 
Yeah, I, I, yes, yeah. I, w I went to um, NYU graduate film school um, after getting a degree in political science and communications. And Ginny, you were undergrad at NYU, right? Yeah. But at different times. Different so times. You never crossed paths. Not yeah. then. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about kind of what, um, because this, this film was made a, a few years ago. Um, so why now, why is it on the circuit? Um, what are you doing with this, the streaming platforms? Yeah, well, we had finished the film. We premiered it at Tribeca. I had um, been offered to direct another movie that I was actually in the middle of directing when Tribeca happened. Um, and it went on to, you know, shoot in Budapest and some post-production in London. And so we were, we did play in some festivals and I was, you know, always planning to kind of circle back um, to Radium Girls. But um, we, we ended up making a, a deal with Netflix, but they wanted us to have a theatrical release first. So we were plotting that theatrical release in 2019 when the pandemic happened, we were, our trailers were playing in theaters when the lockdowns started to happen. So we never opened and we just sort of moved into this time of uncertainty that we all moved into. And I began to watch what was happening with um, virtual cinema and um, Netflix was happy to wait for us. Um, you know, they were still there. So we, we decided, you know, by the end of the summer, whatever was going to happen with the physical theaters, we still weren't sure, you know, in August, what was really going to happen. We decided that we would go ahead and um, mount a virtual cinema campaign because the social impact part of it is very important to us. And so we did, so we did sort of start to make our plans in that direction. And then ironically, there are a number of theaters open in the country um, in places like Chicago and Detroit and Minneapolis and Washington, D.C. It's playing in Atlanta right now where I'm from. And um, so, so where theaters are open and people can socially distant and watch safely, that's happening. And then we also have this opportunity for people to um, buy virtual cinema tickets either with our affinity group partners or um, directly from our website. And how did you get uh, connected with Netflix? Well, we, um, I mean, I, I've been a producer in the business for a long time. So I, you know, that, that part wasn't hard. It was more, it was more about them wanting the film. Yeah. Well, how did they become aware of it? Um, I met with executives there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I ask for two reasons. One, Netflix now has a presence in New Mexico, ah. um, along with NBC Universal, yeah. and um, the state film office uh, just um, uh, posted through their newsletter uh, an interview they did with an executive from Netflix about how to pitch, uh, mm -hmm. which was you know very good and, and certainly very very important. However, they didn't say who you could pitch to. <laughs> No mm -hmm. phone numbers or email addresses. So, I, you know, I think as a filmmaker, that's that's a really you know a, a tough act to to accomplish. Yeah. Um, being able to uh, pitch to the right people, know how to pitch, and um, I think it's a reality check for a lot of folks that um, just because it you put your heart and soul into it and think it's the best movie in the world, other folks may not think the same way about it. Yeah. I think um, I think there's that, and I think also it's important it's important if you're you know at the beginning to be aligned with producers who have relationships because ultimately it doesn't whether it's Netflix or whether it's you know another studio they really are looking to a, for for a producer to deliver the movie um, or deliver the series or whatever it is so that that component is very important at that particular stage of the game. Um, so, mm. yeah, and uh, with the uh, the kind of new streaming platforms, um, there's an incredible demand for content. Uh, yes, you know, folks are looking for content from all over the world, which in theory makes it easier for a filmmaker to you know get a film made and, and get it distributed. 
So, um, Jenny, uh, um, uh, do you have a, a favorite uh, between screenwriting and directing? I think they're so different. Um, the screenwriting, you know, it's it's funny because I think screenwriting might sound a little more isolated, but I think what I like about both screenwriting and and the experience that we had directing is how collaborative it can be and how and this idea of, of sort of finding the places where there is a lot of joy in in the collaboration and in in the making I um, I love a, a project I'm working on now I've been um, working with some friends who are actors who read the scenes with me and it's this like joyful writing process mm -hmm. that um, I don't think I don't think I'll ever go back to just <laughs> writing alone for <laughs> um, you know and and that was you know working with Brittany too as when we wrote the script together it was there was so much like love and friendship and curiosity and excitement and you know when it's hard there's someone with you <laughs> that it's you know you're it's hard for for you both and. And so I think there's something actually that can be kind of similar about about both because you're you're taking things from a sort of clay and, and giving them shape. Right. We we've sponsored a number of stage readings, hired actors and um, and done readings of uh, our local screenwriters, and um, they find it the screenwriters find it incredibly uh, valuable. Um, you know, pacing and does this joke work and does this dialogue sound right? And, um, you know, I've, <laughs> they're in the audience scribbling away, making their notes <laughs> as the act. And it's great for the actors too. They, you know, continue to get to practice their chops and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, that's a really wonderful experience. Um, um, so, Lydia, are you working? Do you have something going on right now? Always got something, right? Yeah, um, we're re we're releasing a, a six part mini series right now, um, a suitable boy that um, Mira and I are directed and I produced and uh, we filmed it in India last year. So that that'll be it's releasing in India and Europe right now, and it'll be back and for release in December in the in the U.S. And uh, I'm developing um, a book that I bought the rights to called The Songs of the Gorilla Nation. Um, which is about a woman who um, discovers that she um, or is diagnosed with autism at the age of 36, but um, her journey to self-discovery happened through an encounter with gorillas at the Seattle Park Woodland Zoo. Oh, wow. Terrific. Mm. Wow. <laughs> so many stories out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so is there anything else you guys want to talk about? Anything else that um, you want uh, the viewers to, to be aware of? What's, your, what's the website they can go to to, to find out about in, um, uh, Radium Girls? If people want more information about the movie, you can go to radiumgirlsmovie.com and uh, everything is there. And it's um, streaming kind of all over the place. Yeah, right now we have a lot, we, you know, if you go to the website, you'll see where it is playing in physical theaters. We have a play dates um, tab. And then you can also either buy a ticket there to watch it online if you want, or you may have found out about us through the community of a virtual partner. We have a lot of partners like the National Association of Science Teachers or the International Society of Women Engineers. Um, there's the National Women's Studies Association. We have a lot of big national partners and they are promoting the movie to their communities mm -hmm. and the, they, get a, they get a button um, automatically to click and watch. But you can also go to our website and do that. Right. Yeah. Um, Ginny, any, uh, any last words? Yes, I, will, I was just thinking about how, you know, the, the Radium Girls place in this, in this sort of history of understanding, not just workplace danger, but the danger of radioactivity. And I think that something that I love so much about history is these sort of these like invisible webs that, that connect people and places. And I think New Mexico is one of those places that is like, 
completely connected to the story of the Radium Girls, even if it's not obvious. Even beyond me stumbling across this story by way of Los Alamos research, but the fact that what happened during the Manhattan Project and what continued to happen in New Mexico afterwards with, with the testing and this like legacy that goes back before the Radium Girls, but they're a part of, and I think, I think New Mexico has this really special place in that, in that bigger world. So I'm glad we get to talk to, to you about the film. Um, yeah, likewise. Um, it, as a matter of fact, I am about 40 miles as the, as the crow flies from the Trinity site. Uh, so, uh, and, and um, you know, there are, there are the, the downwinders um, about uh, 30 miles south of where I am uh, is Tularosa and a uh, uh, big part of that population discussing um, the literal fallout from the atomic bomb that was never um, addressed uh, with those people. Um, other people, um, you know, got uh, remunerations and that sort of thing, but some people got left out of the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. And I, you know, I think that there's something very sort of of a, of a Greek tragedy with, you know, with, with Trinity, with, I mean, there's so much like, drama and tragedy in the story of of the Manhattan Project, you know, like the interpersonal, the the big picture. And I think that that's something with the Radium Girls too, that Brittany and I were sort of struck down by was the the the, the epic tragedy, but also the sort of epic, you know, human struggle against the sort of forces that would tear you down that really feels like something, you know, Euripides would write, but it's, but it's glowing. Right. <laughs> but it's glowing. <laughs> um, well, to, to bring it full circle, yeah. I, I was really tickled that, um, you know, we had been in the New York Times when we released the film and, and then we were in the Times again this, this week because the New York Times does this teenagers in time, in the Times, uh, once a month. And so they pull all the articles that they've done about teenagers and they put it in one place for teenagers and parents to kind of look through. So I was really tickled that, you know, in the middle of articles about TikTok and, you know, reality shows, they had the radium girls and <laughs> it felt like our teenage girls were kind of in the mix where they have long belonged to be. So. Right. That felt good. Have you gotten any feedback, either of you, from, from young girls uh, that have seen the film? Yeah, we are getting, we are getting feedback. There, we, we, are, we had an audience that was willing and waiting because there's a play that um, has been the top, top um, it's been in the top 10 high school plays of the last three years and it's called radium girls and girls all over the country have been doing this play in fact jenny and i are attending a zoom performance this weekend that the archer school in la is doing of the radium girls play and um they started writing to us immediately when they heard we were making a movie and so there's been a lot of joy that um we're all able to exchange work <laughs> oh that's terrific yeah. Always nice to um, get that perspective from, um, you know, younger folks and um, oftentimes they, it, it, it kind of hurts when they don't know people that you know, right? I mean, uh, you know, on a, a national celebrity um, level or, you know, you're telling a story and they're, they are unaware of, um, you know, Bruce Springsteen or something, I don't know. <laughs> Um, well, listen, it's been really terrific talking with you both. Um, I wish you the very best of luck in, in all your future endeavors. And um, I'll just tell folks that um, this is on behalf of George Martin's um, Jean Cocteau Cinema in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And um, you can see everything that they're streaming online at JeanCocteauCinema.com. Um, so again, uh, very, uh, very terrific and, and nice to meet you both. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. All right.